This is gonna take Cracker Jack timing, Wang. Total concentration. You ready, Jack? I was born ready. Welcome back to Thinking Critical. This is Wes, and this week, Eric, Bree, and I decided we were gonna do like a top five list, and I said, Eric, in your opinion, being the man that's been reading comic books you know, longer than I've been alive, what are the most five impactful story arcs or comic events of all times, like game changers, things that really had impact, things that we're not seeing so much in today's story arcs and, and events? And he came back in about 14 seconds. I believe he had already had this list. And here with me to talk about this, obviously, is the comic book hoarder. No, no, he's not the hoarder. He's the voice of the voiceless. He is the voice of the comic book reader. Eric Brain, how you doing? I'm doing good. All right, so you came back quick. So this is something that's been on your mind, or is just this is just something that you innately know? Yeah, a little of both. I mean, it's I, I've had my idea on, on what the what the major events or storylines were, and yeah, you, you hit me at the right place, right time. My mind was already on that, I guess, because <laughs> it did not take long to come up with. No, it did not, which helped me out. So uh, we are ready. I've got the list ready. This is this is Breen's list, and I, I will admit that this is this is very good. These are all game changers. Number one, you're going in chronological order. It was, this is almost like a history lesson here. Number one, Action Comics number one, the star of it all, May 1938, Jerry Siegel, Joe Schuster, Superman, Champion of the Oppressed, is one of these stories in this anthology. It's 13 pages of per perfection. And listen to this, Breen. We get the first appearance of superheroes. Just superheroes, mm -hmm. not only and Superman, uh, Jor El, the Kents, Lois Lane, Krypton, Christo Kryptonian rockets, the Daily Star. So many things introduced, like the foundation of the entire Superman universe. The powers are different, but the character is right there, waiting to be molded. The reason why I chose this, for obvious reasons, this was the birth of the superhero. Before that, there had been adventure heroes in pulps and in comic strips. You know, characters like Zorro. Green Hornet, Tarzan, The Shadow, people like that. But this was, the, those were all characters that that were human, that, that had you know it enhanced abilities, but enhanced the way a human can you know it enhance powers, but no more. Superman was a super powered being, and it was something that re we really hadn't seen up to that point. And the it's interesting. The original concept was for something called reign of the Superman, where he was created as a villain and couldn't get any traction with that. So they reimagined him as they said, the hero of the oppressed and the success from that opened the floodgates to all the heroes that followed everybody from Batman to captain America to, you know, wonder woman. It, and the list goes on and on and on, but that I don't think any of that happens without Superman. It's certainly the spark they ignited. And DC is, uh, well, are they even D DC? They're not a DC Comics at this time, but this is the beginning of, of, you know, the dynasty of comic book superheroes. Now the biggest market as far as entertainment in the world, dominating the box office. And Superman's a little different. He can't fly, but he can jump really, really high. Hence the leap tall buildings in a single <laughs> bound. It was uh, one quarter of a mile was what was stated at the beginning. It's a fun story. It's got a classic cover. He's uh, he's holding up a car worth millions of dollars if you can if you have one of these in your collections. It's something that uh, everyone would love to get their hands on. I got to ask you, Eric, I know you've held, you personally owned a lot of comic book history. I know, I think you had like a, a, a grade one, like maybe first appearance of Hulk or something like that. Have you ever touched this comic? No. In fact, I honestly don't think I've ever even seen one at a show. That is that is too bad. Hopefully one day you'll get to see. Obviously, the I think the best, the most well-preserved copy was a part of, uh, was it Mile High Comics? Could have been. Yeah, there's the, there was a collection in, in Colorado where it's not very humid. And there's a just a collection of all this golden age comics that Chuck Rosansky got his hands on. It's never it was never graded. It was just like in this glass case. It was eventually auctioned off for a hell of a lot of money, and it's believed to be the best preserved copy of that comic book. I don't know how often do you read this one? Uh probably once every couple of years. 
you haven't read Action Comics, you need to go back because that is essentially the start of the superhero genre and the, the hobby that we all know and love. Now, this is number two. We're sticking with some DC characters. Showcase number four, which you re you call The Return of Superheroes, October 1956. This is Robert Koeniger, Carmine Infantino, in Mystery of the Human Thunderbolt. There's actually two Flash stories. The first one is 13 pages. We get the first appearance of Flash Barry Allen, Iris West, Turtle Man, Flash Jay Garrick, because he's reading a comic book with him in it, Central City, the CCPD Scientific Detection Bureau, Flash's Ring, lots of stuff introduced here. Why is this in your your opinion, the second big game changer in comic books. Okay. It would have been easy to say the 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 Wortham comic book trials would have been number two. But what what not led, really a story. What led to that was you know post World War II superheroes had fallen out of fashion and the industry was trying to find other ways to entertain the kiddies. So <clears> the <throat> science fiction stories were popular for a while, but there was no oversight. So someone decided to try horror and crime and those comics thrived for a while, but they were, a lot of them were very graphic, very gory. And they eventually just tried to out shock each other. Now there were exceptions like EC comics did tremendous stories that are, that still hold up today. A lot of them were just, you know, let's see how much we can shock and awe. And the superhero, other than you know, Batman, Superman, Wonder Woman, they they were they pretty much disappeared. Marvel had stopped doing their or Timely had stopped doing their heroes. And the it got apparently they got to the point to where people were really starting to think they were doing damage to you know kids developing brains. So the trials happened that created the comic book code and all of those books disappeared. Well, something had to fill that void because comics, other than what, what Dell was doing, it was very homogenized. Um, and th there's just very, very safe entertainment, which was fine, but people wanted more. So, you know, Robert Kaniger and I'm sure some of the other editors at DC said, maybe this would be a good time to try to revise some superheroes but instead of just bringing back jay garrick they created an entirely new flash and didn't know immediately because in those days you couldn't find out right off the bat how well something had done sales figures came in from that and they put him in two more showcase issues than his own title and again that opened the floodgates to new versions of green lantern the atom the revised hawkman etc etc which led to the Justice League, and it was it basically was a rebirth, the first one, of <laughs> of, of superheroes. Amazing stuff, and I'll tell you, Carmine Infantino. Oh, so he looks so good on the Flash. It's a good thing he has such a history with the character because you can just see in the first cover, like the first issue, he gets the character and how to make him look amazing. Absolutely. So let's go on to your number three, and this one's a big one. This is this is another game changer. In fact, you dubbed this one changing the game. This is Fantastic Four number one, really the bar birth of Marvel Comics. So much stuff has come out of the Fantastic Four that was set up in the very early days of this, and it really starts a domino effect where this this hits, and all the thing you know, all these new superhero stories uh, and teams come, start coming in. We get the return of Captain America. We get the Avengers, the X-Men. All these things happen within about a five-year period. It starts with Fantastic Four number one in November 1961 with a couple of guys that you may have heard of, Stan Lee and Jack Kirby. The first issue is called The Fantastic Four. First appearances of Mr. Fantastic Reed Richards, Invisible Girl, Sue Storm, Human Torch, Donnie Storm, uh, Thing Ben Grimm, Mole Man, Fantastic Flare, and Marvel One. Now, this is... This is truly a game changer. This is team dynamics. There's a few things set up in, in uh, Fantastic Four, number one, that are just kind of dropped almost immediately. But just the framework of Marvel Comics and what they are going to do moving forward just to change the industry and, and eventually get a stranglehold on it are all started right here. Yeah, we've all heard the story that of the golf outing with uh, like Julius Schwartz and some other DC executives and Martin Goodman if he was there or not, or, you know, but he, what came out of this or not, depending on whether or not the story's true, was that Martin Goodman went to Stan Lee and said, I want 
a teen book to compete with the Justice League. And at that time, Stan had one foot out the door because he was fed up. Um, what, what he had to go through in the late 50s when Martin made him fire everybody. It was basically just down to him and in inventory stories. And you know, Jack Kirby had rejoined the company. It, it was a skeleton crew. And he just, I, I think he was done. But his wife said, well, just do one the way you want to do it. If, if it's good, what, what's the worst that can happen? You can fire you, you're quitting anyway. So Stan and Jack come up with the Fantastic Four. They put it out. It's a success. And within three issues, they're in costume. They're functioning as a superhero team. But unlike the characters at DC, who all got along and everything was, you know, the, the, each issue tied itself up in a nice bow at the end, Fantastic Four had plot lines that continued from issue to issue. They didn't all get along. We got the re we got the return of the Submariner because the Human Torch had quit the team and at the end of issue three, Ben was very angry all the time. That was something they eventually realized when when they knew they had something that was going to last. They had to soften that character, and they dropped the you know Sue should be with me because I'm a real man plot thread. Yeah, <laughs> and it gave him it introduced a girlfriend for him and. You know what? How you know, the the tragic elements of the monster and the blind girl, I and mean, you, but it just and like you said, it it again to use the term opening the floodgates, the creativity that that unleashed in the next three, four, five years of Marvel, absolutely changed the comic book industry forever. Because the only thing that kept them from beating DC earlier than they did was a terrible distribution deal that Martin Goodman had signed that only allowed them to publish eight titles a month. Mm -hmm. which they got around by doing 16 bi-monthly titles to give the illusion that they had a full line. But they said that was the start, and we all saw where that you know, headed off to in the next 10, 15 years that Marvel just left them in the dust. And Fantastic Four opened up so many things. You know, They even opened up a, a gateway to the cosmos. We've got all the wonderful Marvel cosmic universe with all those characters and adventures. All started right here in Fantastic Four number one. Mm -hmm. Now we're going to number four, and I'm going to put this out first. The death of Gwen Stacy, you and I and Joe, we've already done a retrospective on the death of George Stacy, the death of Gwen Stacy. It's going to be up on Saturday. So we're going to go in depth on this for like 45 minutes, and that's that's a big video. But that's one of the ones you, you, you talk about. Amazing Spider-Man 121, you called it The End of Innocence, released in June uh, 1973. Jerry Conway, Gil Kane, John Romita Sr., uh, the night when da when Stacy died, fantastic comic book, as you said, a game changer. You know, now the hero's girlfriend, the love of his life, can can die in the comic book. The consequences have changed. The stakes have raised. There's no looking back now. You know, the bar has been <clears throat> raised as far as what are the consequences of being a hero. Yeah, the up to this point now, there prior to this, thirty issues prior to that, they had killed her father, had, um, Captain George Stacy. And that had an impact in that, you know, a few issues later, they did the Harry Osborne gets hooked on drugs story that was that actually the Food and Drug Administration had asked Dan to do and the code wouldn't approve, but he did it anyway. And, and so like this, you know, Captain Stacy's death was unique because, okay, he didn't come back. He was dead. But 30 issues later, when they did it again with, with Gwen Stacy, it's like comic book characters don't actually die. I mean, there's always something that happens, a, a swerve that they pull off at the end and everybody's fine, but not anymore. Now, some people consider the death of Gwen Stacy, the end of the silver age. There's debate on that, whether it's Conan number one, Spider-Man 122, et cetera, et cetera. But this was the first time that th this was an absolute gut punch to fans. Because not only fans, Stan Lee was not happy. <laughs> well, but Stan Lee had asked for it, but it, then he realized what he'd done and immediately <laughs> said, bring her back. And luckily they stood up to him and found a way to do it, but not do it as we'll probably cover at some point, but we've all heard that story as well. But this was, you, you didn't see it coming in those days. Like I said, you know, pre-internet, you didn't get any spoilers. 
they didn't even give you the title at the beginning of the book. They did it at the, on the last page. And there was no you know, speech at the at least at least Captain Stacy got to give a little speech. Yeah. Gwen you from the time you see the goblin come up to the window where she's in Peter's apartment, there are, there are no more words. You know, there are no goodbyes, nothing. And the, the, like I said, the character that everybody thought that the most popular character at Marvel Comics was going to marry was dead for real. And that was, that was a turning point in the industry. In fact, that's even what it says on the cover of 121. And it truly was because after that, I was like, you can, you can do stories like this. And number five, this is the last big one that you chose. Obviously, there's been other things that have happened, but you decided to go with Crisis on Infinite uh, on Infinite Earths. DC Comics grows up, as you put it, 12 issues starting in April 1985, March 1986. That's the core series. There's also 40 crossover issues. So this is you know a, a trailblazer as far as how uh, events are done nowadays. Marv Wolfman, George Perez. At the end of Crisis on Infinite Earths, we've got Barry Allen, Flash, Supergirl, Superwoman, Hunter's Helena Wayne, Lois Lane from Earth 3, Nighthawk, Owlman, Salivar, Ultraman, and Anti-Monitor are all dead. Erased from history, we've got Hippolyta, Jimmy Olsen, Lana Lang, Lois Lane, Steve Trevor, Superman, Earth 1, Wonder Woman, Earth 1, and Wonder Woman, Earth 2. Huge ramifications and another game changer. Daisy decided they needed to revive, revamp the line, needed to change the direction, clean up some of their history, and move forward. And Crisis on Infinite Earths was was what did it. Well, one of the things that DC had been doing over the years, they were very big on imaginary stories. And that's where the term not a hoax, not an imaginary story came from because DC did so many of them. But what it also, and that you could call this the law of unintended consequences, Anybody with an idea could just set it on any earth that they chose. So eventually there was a multiverse before there was a name for it. And in the mid eighties, after getting their clock cleaned by Marvel for years and years, I guess they figured we need to clean this up, give it one, you know, get back to the basics, one earth and one set of characters. So the crisis basically merged all those worlds into one. And that allowed them to keep characters from Earth 2 that they wanted to continue using. And with the redundancy that that caused, that's why the the like the Superman cast from Earth 2 were gone. Batman had already died years earlier, so they didn't have to worry about that. And they decided, well, we'll, we'll get rid of the certain characters from Earth 2 and reintroduce them as you know, different versions, you know, like, like Huntress. And... It. They also they they as you said they you know, killed off some major characters, I and mean, the Flash had had his own. I mean, he was the start of the Silver Age, and they killed him, and <clears throat> you know, Supergirl and, and many others. But the, and this also allowed them to reimagine Superman, which was tasked to John Byrne, and, and was you know, incredibly successful. A lot of the other characters. I, Batman was basically left alone with the exception of they changed Jason Todd from a car, a carbon copy of Dick Grayson to a street punk. And, but other than that, the, the bat mythos was largely left intact. Green Lantern was fairly you know, left intact. Um, and then they, then they started you know, tweaking with it, but the, the crisis itself was DC finally getting out of, what you know, Englantine refers to as Silver Age silliness to what they would eventually become. And for years, it led to outstanding comics line wide. Yeah, this is at the trail end of, of Marvel Comics, really, maybe at their apex as far as creativity. Some of the greatest comic runs in the history of, of, of the industry. DC Comics needed to make, make a change. Marvel Open, George Perez were the men for the job. Prices on Infinite Earths, ramifications are still reverberating as far as DC Comics to this day. I think you picked the right five story arcs slash events, Eric Breen. We got Action Comics number one, Showcase number four, Fantastic Four number one, Death of Gwen Stacy, and Crisis on Infinite Earths are your five events slash story arcs that really 
change the game as far as comic books. Do you have anything else to say before we wrap this up? Just real quick on the crisis. You said there were 40 crossover issues. That's yes. official. There's about another 80 or so that are loosely tied to it. You don't have to read them, but it, it, if you put the list together in order and read it, it's it's a blast. And don't be, anybody that hasn't read this, don't be put off by the crisis after crisis after crisis that have followed. This is one that everybody that's a serious comic book fan needs to have read at some point because you'll get so much out of it. And I don't care how many times you read it, you will see things you didn't see the time before. It's very, very dense, but concise at the same time. If that, if, if, if that makes any sense, it's a great read as are the other four, the other, the other four things we talked about and, Go out and read those stories if you haven't. 